to conclude our series on preparing for revival. Now, if you remember when I started this several weeks ago, I told you that I was starting with the end result. I was starting with the end result and I was going to work backwards. Anybody remembers that? I was starting with the end result and I was going to work backwards and show us how we achieve that desired result, how we achieve the end that we began with. Um, I'm not going to take much time for review because I have quite a bit I would like to cover tonight, but as usual, God overrules. Amen? He does the overruling, but I have quite a bit that I would like to do tonight. We, we started out with Ephesians chapter 5. We, we actually um, started back, we started first in chapter 5, then we worked backwards to chapter 4, and we're ending up in chapter 5. We started with chapter 5, verses 18 through 21, and be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And we noted that we weren't talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but we're talking about an ongoing overflow in the Holy Spirit. In other words, just the way when we got born again, we trusted Jesus Christ to take away our sins. Now we must trust the Holy Ghost for an ongoing daily leading us, taking us by the hand as the advocate, the counselor, the paraclete that he is, to take us daily walking with the Holy Ghost. Do you remember that? All right. And we said spirit-filled people speak to themselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Spirit-filled people, they sing and make melody in their hearts to the Lord. They're controlled by the Spirit. Spirit-filled people, their lives are characterized by thankfulness. They don't walk around with an attitude of entitlement. We're thankful and we're filled with the Spirit. Always thankful because you know what? God is a good God. All the time. He never holds back on you. He's always good. Not some of the time. He's always good. When you come to hard places in your life, he's still good. Hallelujah. He's always good. So we live a thankful life. Amen. It says, speaking to ourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in our hearts to the Lord. And we noted that it continues giving thanks always for all things unto God and to the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 21, submitting one to another in the fear of the Lord. We prefer others before ourselves. And I continue to say, I have the formula for a successful, long-lasting marriage. Jesus said, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another. He said, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples, if you have love one for another. And that's the agape. That's the foundation. When you get the agape right and you begin to submit one to another in the fear of the Lord, nobody's holding on to their rights. We're preferring the other person above ourselves. That's the agape that Jesus said will characterize his body, will characterize the people that are his kingdom citizens. Now, if you are living on a foundation of agape, which you shouldn't be unequally yoked with an unbeliever anyway. That is Bible. So if both of you are living this agape love on a platonic level, when you get married, that is still the foundation of the way you live. Everything is filtered to 
to agape. Then the phileo and the eris will fall into place. Are you with me here? So, when we're filled with the Holy Ghost, too many people think filled with the Holy Ghost is walking around and speaking in tongues all the time. You speak in tongues all the time, but that's private. I shouldn't hear you around here speaking in tongues out loud unless you have an interpretation. That is Bible. That is order. Being filled with the Spirit is being controlled, directed, orchestrated, led by the Holy Spirit on a daily, minutely, hourly basis. That's how we live our lives as Christians. In an orderly church, it says when you, when you speak in tongues, you edify, you build up yourself. Mm -hmm. yes. But when you speak out, you edify the body. But we don't understand tongues, so if you have that, God will also give you the interpretation. You prophesy at the level of your faith, so you shouldn't be just speaking out loud in tongues. It's for your private worship. And you can speak in tongues in church, but you sit in your chair and you do it to yourself. Are you with me? Yeah, praise God. Amen. Amen. That's order. That's Bible. But I'm back to being filled with the Holy Spirit. He's not only speaking in tongues. Paul says, I speak in tongues more than all of you. But in the congregation, I would rather speak two words in a known language. And he was not being negative about tongues. He was referring to order. Order in the church. When an unbeliever comes in and everybody's jumping all over and speaking out loud in tongues, they <laughs> think we're mad. Uh -huh. Because they don't understand what uh -huh. we're talking about. Uh -huh. And that was not God's intention. Uh -uh. Are you with me here? Yes. So we have to be controlled, directed, led, guided by the Holy Spirit on a consistent basis. That is a spirit-filled life. That's how come we can demonstrate the joy of the Lord at all times, which is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. Yes, amen. The Holy Spirit is in us, that joy of the Lord is bubbling out of our bellies. Are you with me here? Mm -hmm. In other words, it doesn't mean you're never going to have a problem because you will. Hello. But if your strength fails in the day of adversity, your strength is small. That's what it says in Proverbs. <laughs> Anybody can jump up and down when everything is going right. Mm -hmm. It's supernatural. When you demonstrate joy when everything is going wrong, mm -hmm. that's something the devil has no answer uh -huh. for. He just has to back up and leave you alone. Because that is supernatural. When everything is going well, it doesn't take any faith. Because everything is going well. Hello. Are you with me here? That's right. Praise the Lord. All right. Let me see if I can transition into tonight's lesson and um, believe God to get through it because I want to finish this tonight. Okay. All right. <laughs> so turn with me please to Ephesians chapter 5 beginning at verse 1. Actually, the way this works really if we get all of the meat out of verses 1 and 2, the rest of the passage up to about verse 11 pretty much takes care of itself. So let's see if we can um, do that. In verse, verse 1 it says, verses 1 and 2, Be ye therefore followers. Well, when it says therefore, it is um, connecting to the passage that went before. So
So let's go back to chapter 4 and verse 30 and begin reading there. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God by whom you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Verse 32. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Be ye therefore. Okay? When we're kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God forgave us, then we're demonstrating what it says in verse 1, that we are followers of God as dear children. Are you with me? Followers of God as dear children and walk in love. As Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us. Notice this. It took me three weeks. I meditated on this for three weeks because I could never get it. Maybe you're smart and you'll get it right away. But I could not get it why it had an offering and a sacrifice. But I got it. Glory to God. And hopefully you get it tonight. An offering and a sacrifice. I couldn't see why they needed both words and what was the significance and what it indicated. But I got it. Praise the Lord. I waited and I got it. But it says, And walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us. An offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. So here in verse 1, beginning at verse 1, we are admonished to be followers, to be followers of our Father. Amen. And notice the endearing term that is used here, dear children. Dear children. He uses an endearing term. Or we could translate it as children beloved. That's how God looks at us. We're children beloved. Hallelujah. He's not trying to beat us over the head. He's not trying to tell us how bad we are. He's calling us dear children. In the Greek, it's techna agapeta. Do you see the word agape in there? Children of his love. Hallelujah. Dear children. So, we are to be imitators of our father. Oh, come on, if you have children, you know, when my girls were little, they liked to get in my closet and wear shoes, wear high heel shoes, and get into my makeup and, and, and all that stuff. They were imitators. The girls were imitators of their mother. When Anne-Marie was about a year or two, she could talk. She says, when I grow up, I'm just good. I'm going to be just like my mommy. I'm going to go to work, and I'm going to come home, and I'm going to comb hair style. I'm going to be just like mommy. And somebody met her and said, does she have to have all those lipstick in her purse like you? <laughs> Imitators. Hello. Imitators. She was imitating her mommy, so now it becomes a lifestyle. Come on, are you catching this? Glory to God. We've got to be imitators of our daddy until it becomes a lifestyle. It gets in our gut. Praise God. So the reason that we are to be imitators is that we have received him. We've received his love. That love has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. Amen. And First Peter says we are partakers of his divine nature. This is not fun and games, guys. This is not pie in the sky by and by when you die. This is reality. This is now when we got born again. We received holy seed. We received holy genes. We received God genes. His genes are in us. That's why the Bible says we've been regenerated. We've been regenerated. God's genes are in, are in us, so we're expected to act like him. That's not later. That is now. God's genes are in us 
us now. God's genes are in us today. God's love has been shed abroad in our hearts today. We're partakers of the divine nature today. Amen. Not when we go to heaven. Now. That's why it's supernatural. That's why being born again is a miracle. How do you, a living natural person, walk around with the spirit of God alive on the inside of you? It's supernatural. It's a miracle. Hallelujah. If I were you, I would just stand up right now, lift my hands to glory, and praise God that you're born again, that the spirit of God is alive on the inside. in the beginning it's a struggle because your flesh is still alive mm -hmm. your flesh is still alive mm -hmm. so you have to allow the spirit of God in you by faith to dominate that sin nature that wants to rule your life all the time amen, amen. but we have to amen. realize that agape is in us and let it overrule. Amen? This is the love that was exhibited on the cross. Where Jesus Christ did not only give himself for us, but he went on the cross in place of us. He went there in our stead. He became our substitute. He paid the full penalty. Mm -hmm. Because God's holy law was violated. Sin violates God's law. God's law. And God's holy law was violated. And that violated law demands justice. It demands justice. And so this agape love took our place on the cross that the justice of God was satisfied at the expense of Jesus Christ's life. And we were given that life and given the opportunity of forgiveness and grace and pardon and redemption and ransom and justification because of the agape love of God. Are you with me? That's what was demonstrated on the cross. And that's what Paul did an, an analysis of in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And we also find him listing that agape love in Galatians 5.22 as a fruit of the Spirit. 
a fruit of the Spirit. Amen? So, when, come on, get out of my way. Thank you. So, when this self-sacrificing self love becomes a deciding factor in our choices and a motivating factor in our actions, we can say we're walking in love. Are you with me here? Yes. Let me say that again. When the self-sacrificing love becomes a deciding factor in our choices, when somebody plucks your last nerve and you are ready to snap the taste out of their mouth, you make the choice. You make the choice to walk in love. You make the choice mm -hmm. to smile, even when you don't want to. Mm -hmm. You make the choice. Come on. You get the whole idea? You make the choice. You choose. Mm -hmm. You choose mm -hmm. to demonstrate the love of God that's been shed abroad in, in your heart by the Holy Ghost instead of allowing your old nature to overrule the choice yes. to be like your father. Thank Does that make sense to you? Yes. Are you with me here? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, this is not performance. This is not something you, you grit your teeth and, and struggle to do. It's not performance. It's a yielding person of the Holy Ghost yes. that's in you, mm -hmm. helping you, yes. and guiding you, and leading you, and encouraging you mm -hmm. to do it God's way. You're not out there on your own. You're not out there on your own. Mm -hmm. He's with you. He's in you Amen. as your advocate Hallelujah. and your counselor Amen. and your paraclete Hallelujah. to be with you. You're not there on your own. But if you don't pay attention, the devil will tell you you're out there on your own and you can't make it, so you have to fly off the handle the way you always did. But how many know he's a liar? Amen. Oh yeah, you don't have to listen to him. You already know his character. It never changes. He's always a liar. And he's always a thief. He comes to thief, steal your peace, and to steal your relationship. Because when we're walking in love, we're going to be able to have good relationships and to maintain good relationships when we're walking in love. Amen? Amen. So it's yielding. It's not performing. It's not trying to do it yourself mm -hmm. and grit your teeth and it's really hard. It's yielding. Mm -hmm. It's Amen. yielding to the Holy Ghost. Baby, if for you that means counting to ten, count to ten. Mm -hmm. If it means backing up for a minute and don't answer right away, if that's what you need to do, do it. Mm -hmm. Because it's probably the Holy Ghost whispering in your ears and saying, mm -hmm. just slow down for a minute. Mm -hmm. Just slow down and find your center. Mm -hmm. Just calm down. Mm -hmm. You don't have to answer right away. Offering and sacrifice. I love it. <laughs> Offering and sacrifice. I did a lot of study on this. Because I, 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 just, I just couldn't get it. All right. Now. So, bear with me here. I, I want you to get this. All right. Offering, the word offering, it means to carry to. It means to carry to. It is used of the blood offerings of the Levitical systems. Remember, in Leviticus, the animals were brought mm -hmm. to the priest. Mm -hmm. And the 
they were slaughtered and the blood was taken and sprinkled. Okay? So our Lord Jesus fulfilled these by himself becoming a sin offering for us. He went to the cross as an offering for our sin, as a substitute for us. Paul calls it, and John also, a propitiation, or literally a mercy seat. He became a substitute for us. The sacrifice, however, that sacrifice, it means to kill a sacrificial victim. It means to sacrifice. So under the Levitical system, the, the sacrifice was brought, it was killed, and the blood taken to be sprinkled. However, the animal itself was also taken and placed on the brazen altar, mm -hmm. and the fire was used to roast this offering, so that sweet savor went up into the nostrils of God. Are you with me? The offering has to do with the blood. And the sacrifice has to do with the carcass. Jesus became both. Jesus became both. Yes. Yes, I, 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 I've been reading this for years. And I didn't get it. I get what, why do we have both of them? And I've been studying and studying, and it just, it just didn't click for me. I wasn't satisfied with, with what I was finding. But now, now I got it. Now I got it. Did you get it? Yes. You get it? Simple, isn't it? Amen. Amen. So Jesus Christ fulfilled both the offering and the sacrifice. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 10. The writer to the Hebrews refers to this. Hebrews chapter 10, we'll read verses 8 through 14. Hebrews chapter 10. Let's read from verse 7. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book, it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. Above when he said sacrifice, notice here, in, in Hebrews, it's talking about sacrifice and offering. Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin, thou wouldst not, neither had pleasure in them. God did not have any pleasure in those dead sacrifices. It was a temporary measure until the true sacrifice, the only acceptable one, Jesus Christ, would have come. It says he had no pleasure in them. Verse 9, Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first. He taketh away the, the old, the, the dead animals being brought. He took that away, and then he established the second, which is the one true sacrifice. Verse 10, by which will we are sanctified, notice this, through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Hallelujah. Amen. He did it one time. Oh, it was acceptable yeah. to the Father. It never has to be repeated again. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Verse 11. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering, notice here, offer the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. Verse 14. If you haven't memorized this verse yet, it's a good one to memorize. For by one offering, he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. Listen to me. Are you sanctified? Yes. You're sanctified. You're set apart to God. You've been set 
separated from your sins, but not just left in a vacuum. You're separated from your sins, but you're separated unto God. You are sanctified. I like to put it this way. Now you move up to the rank of the good China. You are in the, the China cabinet where you only come out at Thanksgiving and Christmas and special guests. You have the gold and the edges. You don't go in the microwave and you don't go in the dishwasher. You're too special. Hallelujah. You're not the Corel in the kitchen that you use every day. No, no, no. You're sanctified. No, you're the good china. Glory to God. For by one offering, he's perfected forever them that are sanctified. Them that are set apart to God. You are set Amen. Glory to God. All right. Now, so, all of that is in, involved in verses 1 and 2. All that I've just been saying is involved in verses 1 and 2. So, as a result of learning and understanding and practicing verses 1 and 2, along with Galatians 5.24, because Galatians 5.22 and 23 list the fruit of the Spirit. But Galatians 5.24 says, Those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its affection and its lust, or some translations say with its appetites and its desires. Do you belong to Christ? Talk to me. Yes, you belong to Christ. So you have already in Christ crucified your flesh with its appetite and its desires. It should rule you. It should override your choices. You belong to Christ. Those that are Christ have crucified the flesh with its appetites and its desires or its affections and its lust. We've crucified that flesh. It shouldn't rule us anymore and dominate our lives. You get the whole idea here? So when we learn verses 1 and 2 of Ephesians chapter 5, and we practice that along with Ephesians 5, 22 through 24, listen to me, we will manage to have victory over everything listed in the middle of the chapter. Yes. Glory to God. So I'm just going to read them so we see what we have victory over. It's like, listen, we have to realize that faith is now. Like I shared with you last week on the Sermon on the Mount, it wasn't a one-time thing. It was the result of hours and hours and hours and hours of them sitting and looking into the eyes of love and hearing what he's saying about the kingdom and actually what those said, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed. He was saying, congratulations. That's where you are right now. You're a kingdom citizen. It's not in the future. Oh, come on. Faith is now. We need to get it. No, faith is. Faith is not hope. Hope is future. Faith is now. Now we have crucified the flesh with its appetite and its desires. So we have the victory. We choose the victory. It's ours Amen. by choice. So all of the stuff that's in the middle of the chapter, when we get verses 1 and 2 down, we don't have to deal with these. When we know faith is now. All right? Verse 3. But fornication and all uncleanness and covetousness, let it not be named among you as becoming saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. So instead of using your mouth to jest and speak idly, you use your mouth to give thanks, because it's not convenient for a Christian to be jesting and talking idly. It doesn't mean you're going to live like a stuffed shirt and you can't smile or laugh. Come on now. But we have to make choices with the words that we use and what comes out of our mouth. Because Jesus said, 
It's not what goes into a man that defiles the man, that is what comes out of the man, because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. When your mouth speaks, it's showing what's in your heart. For this ye you know, that no fornicator, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater, hath an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain or empty words, for because of these things come at the wrath of God upon the sons of disobedience. Be ye therefore, be ye not, be not ye therefore partakers with them. For ye were once darkness. Mm -hmm. That means shadiness. You were once darkness, but not anymore. Now are you light in the Lord? Jesus said, you are the light of the world. A city that sat on a hill cannot be hidden. You are the light of the world. You were once darkness, people, but now, now, Jesus Christ is light, and he lives on the inside of us by the Holy Ghost. We're no longer in darkness. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank God for that. For once, you, you were once darkness, but now, are you light in the Lord? Walk as children of light. In other words, conduct your behavior as children of light. Continue to imitate your Father. Glory to God. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Verse 11. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. Mm -hmm. We have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. We can't be buddy-buddy with the unfruitful work of, works of darkness, but we reprove them by showing them the love of God. Amen. We don't participate in what they do. We don't scorn them or stay away, but we have to take the light to them. We take the light to them, but we don't participate in the dark deeds. Hello? And if you're not strong enough, don't go yet. Don't go yet. Don't go till you're ready. And take somebody with you. I guess that's why Jesus said, send them out two by two. The strong one and the weak one. Don't go into the bar yet. To try to get them out. Then you come out like. <laughs> still going to love you, but I'm going to rebuke you. I'm not going to love you enough to leave you in the mess. If I see you, I'm calling you on it. That's my job. Sorry. Still got to love me because I'm going to do it in love. But that's my job. I'm not going to stand idly by and let you serve the devil. Not going to do it. Wouldn't be prudent. Amen. Not going to do it. Wouldn't be prudent. Amen. Are you with me here? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We have to walk as children of light because we are now lights in the Lord. Verse 13, but all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatever doth make manifest is light. I've told this story several times, and I'll tell this story again. When I first happened upon that verse, I just grabbed a hold of it, and I used it for myself as a weapon in darkness. 
I tell the story of how I hired a manager and all of a sudden when I hired this manager, cash started to go wrong in my store. Cash started to come up short. Okay? And all my managers, and, and, and I say this, you know I don't have not a racist bone in my body. I'm Jamaican, out of many one people. But all the managers I hired were white. All the managers were white, and my bosses were white. And I'm a black Jamaican woman. So I, I, I know I never had cash problems until I hired this one. Joe, are you leaving? Did I offend you? I'm teasing. But, so I knew I never had a problem until this particular manager came in the store. And I knew, but they're not listening to me. And this one black woman talking to all of these white men, and they're not listening to me, and I know what I was talking about. But I didn't have the evidence yet, but I knew it. Because if, if something is going wrong when a new person comes in, hello, that's not rocket science. So I went home, and I pulled my Bible up, maybe I had it at work with me. I pulled that scripture out and I said, Father, in the name of Jesus, I reprove this situation, Lord, and thank you for showing the light. Hmm. Amen. I went back to work next day. I'm not smiling about this, but I'm sorry, he got a heart attack. He was in a hospital and he never came back to work. And my cash never went funny again. And then we found out exactly what he was doing. I asked the Lord to show it and he showed it. He was putting in fictitious cashiers in the register and ringing up the money on those fictitious careers. Then he took that money, put it in his pocket. But since it was fictitious, that money is going to come out of the cash. Because he was taking it out, but it wasn't going in. It was go going off another cashier number. And God showed it. He put the light right on it. Expose. When you reprove the evil works of darkness, the light of Christ makes it manifest. Case was closed. Nobody had another word to say. Not another word. 